Hey guys, how's it going? Today we are working on several different things out here in the garden. Starting off with some garlic planting here in four of our raised beds. Then we're gonna head out to the cut flower garden. We're gonna check to see if there are strawberries and raspberries ready to be harvested. Uh, we are gonna tag one of our rows of dahlias. So we're gonna work on identifying all the different varieties in one of our rows. And then if we have time, I'm hoping to get a couple of plants in the ground. Okay, let's just jump right in. We've got two different varieties of garlic that we're gonna be putting in. We've got Danaski, is that how you say it? D-U-G-N-A-S-K. It's a hardneck variety and another hardneck variety called Spanish Rojo. So there are two different kinds, hardneck and softneck. There are pros and cons to each kind. I've grown both. They're both really good. Softnecks, just in short, they're a good kind for braiding. They have a lot more flexible stem. Uh, they typically have more cloves per head. Oftentimes they're a little bit smaller than hardneck cloves because there's so many more per head. Uh, they do store longer than hardneck and they are more mild. Hardneck varieties, they have a central stem that's really hard and firm and then their cloves surround that stem. For example, you can see this when I peeled back the skin so you can see how those cloves just surround that central stem. Because there are fewer cloves, did I say they usually average about 6 to 11? per head but they're usually a little bit bigger than soft neck but that can wildly depend on how fertile your soil is and you know how it goes during the growing season and what else am i forgetting something they're easier to peel that's for sure but the storage life isn't quite as long on these so that's something to consider you may want to if you're doing all hard neck like i am this year you might want to process some of them instead of just trying to store them whole in their heads uh, like we do in our root cellar even then we'll get like five six months out of them so peeling some and freezing to elongate that um, use usability time might be something that you need to plan on okay so we are going to be planting the Danaski in this bed this is a three by four we're going to do five rows we're also going to be repeating it in another three by four on that side. And then I'm gonna be planting the Spanish Rojo in these two beds right here. When we plant them, we go about four to six inches apart and we go about two to three inches deep. And that is where the bottom of that clove will rest. What you wanna do is take apart the heads, try to keep that skin intact around the cloves. See that, that's the bottom of the clove. You can see that kind of flattened end and that's the top. So we are going to be planting it about two to three inches deep right there. And then it will point up. Instead of digging a trench and because we're doing this in raised beds where the soil is soft, I'm gonna be using this seed dibber right here. This is a huge seed dibber. The lar largest one I think I've ever seen was 30 inches long. Um, it's from Gardener Supply. They sent it out and I thought, what in the world? <laughs> am I going to use that for? Well, this is a perfect way to use it. So they've got little lines, which means inches. So we want it to be about three inches deep. We can put our little marker right there so we can easily see it. And we'll be able to take this. I already did one. And you just push it down in the soil like that. Wherever you want a clove, it makes the perfect hole. And then you can just drop in your garlic clove and then cover it over. I need to get my fertilizer in there first as well. So I'm not going to even separate the rest of my garlic until I've got all my holes done and everything's prepped and ready to go. Garlic is a, not a hard thing to grow. I highly recommend go growing it if you are a beginner because it's kind of like you just put it in the ground. Sometimes you see it come up before the winter, sometimes you don't, but it just lays there and just waits for spring when it wakes up and grows. Now, if it does push growth and then it starts to snow, it's not gonna hurt the, the tips of the leaves at all. It will just pick up and start growing again in the spring. It's just good to have it in there so that it's, cause roots still develop even in the winter. Even if um, it's very, very slow, it's still happening and it just makes for a better crop the next year so long as it doesn't sit in water so that's where the well draining part uh, comes in but other than that it's just such an easy thing to grow I just love it it's a pretty crop too okay let's get this going
All right, guys, we've got them all in just about 240, maybe even over 260 of the Spanish Rojo, about 88 of the Danaski. So that's almost, what is that, 248? <laughs> I'm doing my math right. Anyway, that's a lot of cloves of garlic and each one of those cloves will turn into its own head of garlic by next year. And we harvest right around 4th of July. Uh, the tops will start to die back sometime in like end of May, beginning in June. And then when they have died back far enough, we harvest them right around 4th of July, cure them and get them in storage and then plant again, usually September, October, depending on the year. There's that one. They all look the same. <laughs> Ta-da. There is something going on in there. So, 44 of the Danaskis went in here in a three by four, so five rows. Now, there are uh, drip lines in here, but we're gonna be taking all of those out in the spring and doing drip tape. So it was irrelevant where those were placed. I had already even pulled the drip out of this bed because when we just cleaned it out the other day, I realized how poorly it was watering. So that's why we decided to just do something different. So anyway, we'll be hand watering it this fall uh, and then replacing drip in the spring. So um, 80 roughly 80 of the Spanish Rojo in this bed, 80 in this one, and 44 more of the Danaskis in this bed, keeping it balanced. I love the way that garlic looks in the spring. It's such a uh, sturdy looking crop and it's always fresh and green. Uh, and it just provides a lot of structure in here. And I didn't plant enough this last year. I did one three by six raised bed and the watering failed. The water system was all plugged up with hard water and I didn't realize it. And I noticed that it was drying down earlier than normal and just in passing and then I never addressed it. Anyway, my yield was way down this year. So I may have knee jerked just a tad on the amount of garlic that's in the ground now, but at least we'll have a good crop next year, hopefully. Okay, let's head out to the cut flower garden now. All right, so I wanna pick berries first. I don't expect to get a tremendous amount from anything today. In fact, Bethany came a couple of nights ago and she picked all of the heritage red raspberries, but it already looks like we have another crop ready. Uh, fall golds is kind of what I was after today. I wanted to try to see, oh, there's not gonna be enough for jam. We might get one little cup full of them, <laughs> so we'll eat them fresh. I think that's gonna be the same way with the strawberries today, but you know what, any production we get in October, I'll take it. And our 10 day looks awesome. Like the end of our 10 day, like after the middle part of October, we still have temperatures in the low 80s. And the lows are just in like the mid 40s. So I think we're gonna be able to enjoy a lot of this fruit that's still forming up. Aaron and I were talking the other day about maybe ripping out the red raspberries and putting all fall golds in here because that's the only thing anybody ever wants to eat. They're so sweet and delicious. Okay, so I brought a few berry cups out. Let's see what we can get. a little bit of everything today which makes me really happy. I mean look at how pretty these are. So fall golds I harvested all that I could find that were ready. So not a tremendous amount but a good amount to eat fresh. Ran across a few ripe blackberries. These are so good you guys. I think these are the black satins I want to say. And then I just harvested a little bit of the reds. There's a whole bunch of red raspberries still left out there, but I just didn't want to run out of time. And then we got one of the larger containers full of strawberries. Some of these are monstrous. These are the seascape variety right here, still producing. There's a whole bunch of berries there too that weren't ready yet. Um, so I think we'll just get a smattering here or there until it starts to cool off a little bit more. But again, being able to harvest in October, 
I think that's just the most amazing thing. It's just so wonderful to come out here. I mean, I've been missing it ever since the orchard has kind of petered out. We do have the Fuji apple tree, which I need to pick those apples and I did not spray those like I should have. So most of them have worm damage, but I was thinking I could cut that out and just make a bunch of applesauce out of what we have there. So that's still on the schedule, but I've been missing the peaches and the nectarines and all of that. It felt like we had a good steady amount of fruit throughout the season from the orchard, starting with the apricots and uh, just, yeah, I miss being able to go out there and pick fresh fruit and eat it, like just standing there. So this right here makes me really happy. The last thing we're gonna have time to do today is ID one of the rows of dahlias. I thought we might have a chance to put a couple plants in the ground, but time kind of got away from me there. So this is what we use to ID the dahlias. This is a red flagging tape and then a garden marker. You see the label there? They last a little bit longer than a Sharpie, still not the best. They will wear off eventually, but uh, they're going to only be on these plants for a short amount of time. So I have the first row done here. Look at these dahlias. They are just gorgeous. Such a pretty area right now. So what I'm doing is I'm writing the names of the dahlia, the variety, and then I'm tying them around the base of the plant. So after these plants have succumbed to a frost and the tops have turned black, we will come out, we will cut the tops off, and we're just going to leave enough stems so that the flagging tape stays on, and then we'll dig. And it's just such a great time to get them ID'd right now because uh, it's very easy to get confused about what varieties you think you'll remember what you have. I always think I'll remember what I have anyway, and I always forget, and I always get mixed up and confused. So having them properly ID'd when they're in bloom is the best because you can verify if that's actually the variety that you have planted. And I found a couple of mistakes right here in this first row. Like we had, uh, I bought five tubers in the Linda's Baby Mix is what it was called, and um, some Sweet Natalie's came up, which is one of my favorite dahlias. In fact, I posted a picture of it, I think, yesterday, but... Uh, that's not part of the Linda's baby mix, I don't believe. Let me verify. Okay, it's just called Linda's mix is what I got. And it's supposed to have one called Linda's baby, sweet Fabienne and sweet Suzanne, not the sweet Natalie. And that's what I had come up. There's not even one that looks remotely close to the sweet Natalie in that mix. So uh, I was able to label those correctly though. Had I waited and just used my own labels, like my um, tags that I have in the ground, it would have been wrong and those were brand new like i made the label and popped it in the ground and opened brand new bags of tubers out so it wasn't something to do with you know i don't know mixing it up in storage anyway it's just nice to be able to locate the bottom of the dahlia plant follow it up look at the bloom that it has verify that yes this is a wizard of oz and then i just tie a label around the bottom it does take about 45 minutes per row though so i thought if i did one row per day then it won't seem like this big massive chore um, and it's going to get harder because it gets pretty thick yeah a little harder to navigate when you look down the rows, I'll probably attack this row from this side. It looks a little bit more open, but oh my goodness, when we get into these middle rows, oh, <laughs> look at this. Yeah, it's just, we need to put more space between our rows. Since we're digging them all out this year, I think we will probably eliminate a row at least so we can get a little bit more space, but we probably in reality need to elim eliminate two rows. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, 60 foot rows and then one 47 foot row here. And you guys, the thrips that we had in here, this is why we have so many flowers out here. We usually do, you know, free flower days and give away flowers throughout the season. Uh, but we tried to overwinter our dahlia tubers this past winter. And I think we overwintered thrips in the process. And we only got about a 60% return on the tubers, which honestly, I think it works out to save money just to buy, to fill in the gaps uh, versus, all the labor it takes to get them dug and cleaned and stored and divided and all that business. Uh, but overwintering thrips is not a good thing. So we're not going to do that again this year. However, the predatory mites, that's how we were combating the thrips this year. We're seeing little to no thrip action in the dahlias right now. Still like I'll come across a couple here or there. So we're still not doing free flower day, which is been a little bit of a it's just been a more of a relaxed feel out here honestly because I just had, didn't really worry about the insects I just thought we'll just see what happens this is kind of an experiment and I think next year we'll start in on predatories a little bit sooner earlier in the season so it's a little bit more of a preventative measure rather than waiting to see when you know the problem's really huge anyway all that said we're gonna go down this row and there's some real pretty ones 
Let me just point out a few. Peaches and cream. I just love it. And not every one of them looks the same. Some have a little bit more white. And I on purpose put that one on the end of this row because I knew I was going to love it. Sweet Natalie right here is one of my favorite dahlias ever. It's just so creamy and delicate looking. It's like a very elegant looking dahlia. And I prefer this size or smaller. Like the dinner plate dahlias are just amazing. They're phenomenal looking plants, but they're really hard to work into arrangements. And they're so big um, that, yeah, they're just big and cumbersome and they have very thick, sturdy stems that you can't manipulate. The smaller dahlias with the thinner stems are a little bit easier. Like when you get in here, you can see that this stem, it's strong, but it still has some flex. I like that a lot. This is Cafe Olay Twist right here. I think that's such a fun variation. So you get that creamy color, but then this pink stripiness. There's another one. Again, no two are really the same. This one is a little bit less pink. This is the Linda's Baby right here. Just that clear pink, and I love the perfection. The pompon dahlias just have that balance. I love it. Wizard of Oz, beautiful, delicate pink. It's almost like the Cafe Olay, but smaller in a different you know, style. This one is Kiss Me. And it's just the sweetest light lavender with the white center. I like the white centers. It really makes the plants or the flowers glow. And then we have one called Mystery Day. And it's got little touches of white here and there. I think that's just really fun to look at. Labyrinth, of course, that's a huge, big beauty. That one gets really big too, the plant itself. Here's our Linda's mix, AKA Sweet Natalie's right here. Oh, they're so pretty though, I'm actually thankful. That that's what came up. There's some that I don't care for quite as much, like this one, anemone type dahlias. I'm on the fence about anyway. I did post a reel, it was a picture or a reel, um, of the, is it Sandia brocade? Brocade. And they're the most beautiful peachy orange color. And I, I kind of love those. I don't know if I like this one quite as much. I don't, the pink or the yellow, the yellow mixed in with the pink, I don't know. It kind of looks a little bit like dirty to me. Totally personal opinion though on that. What variety even is that? That's the puffin stuff right there. I have a lot of this one right here. Uh, it kind of comes out in like iridescent pink peach. It's called Caitlin's Joy. Oh, I'm always a fan of this one. Now this is a dinner plate, but I love the color. It's called Clyde's Choice. And they're just like a big old pumpkin and I think they're so pretty. I had the Imperialis, which are like the tree dahlias and this is as big as they got for me. I think this is one I'm gonna have to start earlier in the greenhouse and have some growth on it before I pop it out in the summer or spring, late spring. We've got Melody Dora right here, which I love the compact nature of this one. This would be a great one to put in a container or tuck it into a flower bed because it doesn't get enormous and wanna flop over like every <laughs> every other dahlia out here. I love this one. This is part of a, a Beau Soleil, I think, mix. I think that is so cool, kind of like that cactus type. They're just wild and carefree and I love the color. I think this one's La Luna, maybe. I love this one too. Oh, that creamy yellow with the brighter yellow streaks. Look at this big beast of a yellow one. My goodness gracious. Do I have that labeled? Nope, I don't. I don't know what kind that is. Pretty amazing though. This one's called Poo. The honeybees love it. And I think it's just a very happy Dahlia. Oh, there's just so many out here that are gorgeous. This one I believe is Frank Holmes. I actually used this one quite a lot. It's just that deep burgundy. I think they're so gorgeous. And then there's one called Hepet Blue Eyes. Right down here, ooh, I like that one. Ooh, that's pretty. I think that one's Giggles. Boy, the honeybees really like this type of dahlia. Look at this. Whoa. That one's just starting to open so the color is really vibrant. I want to say that these are a, are these a Thomas Edison? Is that a white one or is it this purple one? I don't know. This is a really gorgeous color. And then there's lilac thyme. Really pretty lavender. Okay, I'm just going to spin around real quick so you can see, oh, Gouda shink right there. The spiky orange and yellow one. Whole bunch of white ones. Mm-hmm, lots of color. Okay, so I need to get to labeling here. This is also a really uh, great time to weed out ones that you don't like so much um, and make notes about that. So there are a few that I'll be um, getting rid of. And there's also a few that I don't know the variety names of that I'll probably give the tubers away. Anyway, we're just gonna get this second row done. I've got my kneeling pad because we are on wood chips and I've got my, my supplies here. So here we go. <laughs>
Oh my goodness, you guys, row number two has been identified. Everything is tagged. That'll make it so much nicer when we go to dig. Oh five more rows to go. And right off the bat, I realized that I improperly ID'd this one. This is a la mode, not peaches and cream. They're similar, uh, but peaches and cream is a lot lighter. But a la mode is gorgeous. I think peaches and cream is in the interior. Let's go look. This one is peaches and cream. So see, it's still in that peachy orange family but it's a lot lighter, a lot more delicate. I have the most of the Sonic Bloom, which is this one right here. It kind of comes out dark and then it ends up just a little bit lighter. See that right there in kind of an open face. And I have a ton of terracotta right here, both of which Florette sent out to me, oh, like three years ago. And they are the most prolific in the tuber department. I mean, we'll dig those and we will get times seven, eight, nine of what we have out here right now. So. I think I'm gonna only save maybe like two plants each of each of those varieties. And we may do some giveaways, you guys, of some of these that I just have way too many of. And you guys, that is gonna be it for today's projects. I'm really happy with the garlic planting. Oh, just one of those fall chores just to check off the list. It's not something that's super tangible right away, but it's always something I'm thankful to have done and in the ground. I also want to, I mean, this is another thing on my list, on my to-do list, as well as harvesting sweet potatoes. I'm gonna wait a little longer on that. I'm gonna wait until after it freezes um, because I think it's gonna make them sweeter. I also need to do cover crops, probably some wheat, uh, that sort of thing, and then more clean out. Some of our flowers are like, they're toast. Snapdragons, not looking so hot. We need to get those pulled probably here pretty soon. Zinnias, on the other hand, are looking magnificent, aren't they? They're just amazing right here. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. I already ate an entire cup full of the fall gold raspberries. I might just sit out here and eat the other cup real quick before I go inside. We'll see, tastes really good. See you guys in the next video, bye.